Tom Verducci here on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you, Tom? I'm good, and thank you for that public service of that warning, Rich, because you can also add once it's in your head, it ain't getting out for a while. It's right. So who's, <laughs> whose job is it going to be to explain? Is it you or Rosenthal tonight to explain it to the audience when it happens, if it happens tonight? Whose gig is I, I that? I want to hear Joe Bucko. I want to hear Joe Bucko uh, deep 411 on, uh, on the shark and the whole story behind it. You did a very nice job with that, by the way. Okay. It's, the- uh, it's crazy. I mean, I don't know that I've seen anything like that in a ballpark where, like, when he's pinch hitting, and his, I think sometimes he intentionally takes his time getting to the plate because they want to hear one verse after another. <laughs> but it's, I mean, and the only thing I could, I guess, equate it to is maybe the rally monkey, right, that the Angels had in the early aughts with their thunder sticks yeah, and, the, yeah. and the rally was, monkey. You know, you had the, the Cardinals had the rally squirrel that one year. There's been all kinds of goofy things that teams ride, but this is as sticky as they come. Uh, but I'll say this, in all seriousness, Rich, Part and kind of the vibe he brings to the team is part of the reason why I think this team has been so hot for the last month. I mean, you see during the games how much fun they have in the dugout, right? Oh, gosh, I know the when dance winning, parties? It's easy to have fun. Right. But they're like that all the time. This had been a tighter team. No better example for me than Steven Strasburg. You know, he used to walk around like, you know, his dog just died every day of the week. And he's hugging it out in the, in the dugout. And these guys are bouncing around and dancing. Yeah, you called it, man. This is as hot of a team as you can find in the month of October, and, man, they're having fun. And the thing that's even more remarkable about it is, Tom, I was in the stadium. We did the, uh, you know, our show from the All-Star game there last year, and it felt like uh, a farewell to Bryce during that home run derby, and everybody sensed it, everybody knew it, and everybody read into it that that's the death of the, the, the franchise. Uh, for years to come, and instead, now they're in the World Series. It's unbelievable. I, I mean, that that as the backdrop to all of this has been remarkable. How did how did it happen? Yeah, don't forget they started nineteen and thirty one too, and Davy Martinez's job was being called into question. Yeah, I think it happened, Rich, at this time of year at least, because this is the first time in all these postseasons that the Nationals have been playing from the underdog role. They didn't have a lot of expectations in the past. They had pitching Harper as you mentioned winning division titles you know taking game fives at home and they would lose those games but this is the first time where it was like all right they're a good team but you know let's see what they do against the Braves the Dodgers the class of the National League and now the 107 win Astros team they've been in a really really good spot now for a while I mean this is now I think it's 32 days they've lost two games it's like they've forgotten how to lose and you know, not even that break, the six days off between the NLCS and the World Series to stop this team at all. I'll tell you right now, this game, obviously, it's a must-win game for the Astros, right? You can't go down 3 nothing. Zach Greinke has to really go out and just deal tonight because the, because the Nationals have so much confidence, the only way to knock them back a bit is to have your pitcher just throw a gem and put some doubt in their minds. Because right now, they're starting this game expecting to win the Nationals. Well, there's no... They, it, I, I shouldn't say there's no way, but um, when the Astros acquired Greinke at the deadline, they didn't have this type of start in their in mind for him, right? Uh, th- this is this is uh, this is no from an interesting I mean, listen, spot. They, had, they went to this World Series with Cole and Verlander at home. You know, they'd never lost back to back days that all year, and they lose both of them at home, where they've just been incredibly good at home. So now, Granky, you're right, is in the situation of not just being a guy to fill out the rotation. He has to be a stopper. And this is a guy who started five postseason games in his career on the road, and he's never won any of them. I mean, he's only one of about four or five pitchers has never won a postseason start on the road with five chances or more. Hasn't pitched well this postseason. Uh, going in with extra rest, and he's not been good on extra rest. He's in a tough spot here. There's a ton of pressure on Zach Granky tonight, but as I said, It's on his shoulders because someone's going to have to cool down that lineup. Tom Verducci here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. He's part of the Fox broadcast tonight. Also MLB Network analyst, Sports Illustrated lead, Major League Baseball reporter, uh, man of many hats joining me here on the Rich Eisen Show. How much of what's going on with the front office of the Houston Astros and the the debacle that was uh, created by the front office and their reaction uh, over the last several days, and then the press conference yesterday with Jeff Lunau, who just kept digging even deeper, it felt to me, based on the way I was watching it. Is that possibly affecting anything that's going on on the field, do you think, Tom? I, 
I don't know that it's affected anything on the field, Rich, but it has affected the vibe around the team. In other words, once the game starts, I'm not sure it, it does matter. But having to answer questions uh, as the manager had to do, which was really it was he was put in a terrible situation. AJ Hinch after that first press uh, release the team put out of trying to pick up some pieces, um, but. Uh, it's just created a bad vibe around the team where these questions and issues you know, are still out there because of the way they flat out have mishandled this. Um, you know, calling a report misleading and fabricated from the start when they really didn't have all the information it was just I mean, it was really bad. I mean, they, they wound up doing the right thing, but I, I do think once you win, the, <laughs> you win the American League pennant on a walk-off home run by Jose Altuve, who's like, you know, rainbows and sunshine. I mean, you can't find a guy who can put a better smile on your face every day than Altuve. And that that became the narrative for the next 48 hours. So, yeah, the vibe around the team is bad. I wouldn't go as – I won't. I don't want to take anything away from the Nets because they've been that good. Right. <clears throat> but it certainly didn't help the environment around the team preparing for the World Series. Well, I mean, and for for – you know, your colleague at Sports Illustrated and Stephanie Epstein to be accused of fabricating something and making stuff up. And it was just so uh, virulent. The first um, uh, statement that Lou now has now said that he was aware of, but he wouldn't say who wrote it uh, and who genuinely generally approved of it going out. And then for him to be asked about whether he had apologized to her yet, he said he was busy uh, flying, hadn't had the time. She was in the room. When he said, she when was he, right there. When he said yeah. that, I, I mean, it's just what? Right? Listen, it all begins with Taubman, right? He's the one who has to take responsibility. His actions created this mess, but the fact that they totally mishandled it from the get-go is something that's systematic in the organization. And Jeff does have to answer for that as well, because certainly multiple sets of eyes looked at that statement before it went out, and that was your first reaction to something—to go attack the people who actually witnessed it. Um, so yeah, it's not just on Talman. It became institutional in terms of the way the Astros handled that. And, you know, Jeff clearly was a hundred percent uncomfortable with that. Even yesterday, you know, pick up the phone. You have to call up Stephanie, make it your priority to take five minutes out of your day, you know, to express a personal apology. And it still hasn't happened. Well, I mean, and then, you know, the players, uh, obviously still there and, and he's not the only one with a history of this stuff. Do you, do you think that this might change the way? that teams actually employ players with this history like Osuna and obviously the Yankees with with uh, their closer and Chapman having a history of this? Do you think this might change anything, Tom? I'd like to say yes, but it still comes down to talent. You know, the better players are going to get more leeway on issues like this. If he is a fringe player, a minor league player, and the Astros have actually done this with a minor league player where there was a domestic violence incident. Actually, it was on, on video. Uh, and they just released the player. But if you're talking about a guy now as the closer on a team trying to win the World Series, right. that unfortunately, I, I think the answer is no, it's not going to change. Tom Verducci here on the Rich Eisen Show. And speaking of the Yankees, Brian Cashman had his uh, exit interview with uh, the New York media yesterday, said that pitching wasn't the issue as to why they're not in the World Series. It was timely hitting. Um, and part of the reason why he said that is uh, Cole and Verlander were, uh, I guess, gettable at some point for the Yankees, and it was posited by a member of the media that he passed on it. He took an issue with that phraseology. What do you say on that subject, Tom Verducci? Yeah, well, they were in it for Cole. You know, there were dips depending on which reports you want to believe. They just didn't have the package the Pirates wanted. Either Miguel Andujar or uh, Gleyber Torres were kind of the stumbling points in that deal. Um, you know, they tried. Verlander, I don't think at the time, I remember, he wasn't throwing that well, and I, I don't think the Yankees were as high on him. Uh, and listen, he's become a much, much better pitcher with the Houston Astros than he was in Detroit. I mean, he's good in Detroit, but he's gone next level. Um, but yeah, listen, their, their MO here is to try to win the world series with a really deep, deep bullpen. And you look at the starting pitcher in this starting pitching in this world series, it's expensive. You know, the average salary for these starters is $25 million and they're all, they're all older. You're not going to see anybody in their twenties starting a game of the world series here. So it's expensive to get great starting pitching and it takes a while. And the only homegrown one in this world series is Steven Strasburg. So yeah, you do have to go out and get it. The Cubs did it certainly in 2016 with their rotation. Um, but yeah, I think the Yankees have to look at maybe being 
a little more diverse offensively, watching these Nationals put the ball in play, and you know, watching um, the Red Sox last year, that certainly works this time of year, right? Fighting off two strike pitches. The Yankees' terrific home run team, not as good as putting the ball in play. And, you know, I still look at, in these games, catching defensively, super important. I I mean, go back to the slider that Chapman threw um, Altuve. Why is he throwing him a slider right there? You know, just you don't need to attack him with a fastball, but throw 100 around the edges of the zone. So the call of that pitch, the problems that Sanchez had, blocking balls, um, calling games, and it bled into his offense, I thought. It really took his offensive game down because he is a great offensive player. You know, that's something looking at in a postseason environment. And I know he's improved a lot, but I think that came back to haunt them a little bit in the mm-hmm. postseason. So I like what Cashman said, though, Rich. It wasn't a failed season. It was a failed game. You know, they lost in the last at bat at mm-hmm. the ALCS game six. So they're, they're still darn good, and they'll be back again next year. A right, couple more questions for you, Tom. Uh, Tom Verducci here on the Rich Eisen Show. What's the postmortem for the Dodgers here in Los Angeles? I mean, talk about a, a disappointing campaign not even making the the LCS. What happens here in L.A.? Yeah, that one's got to hurt. I thought this was their best chance going in. Um, with Kershaw, Ryu, and Bueller, I thought this was a team that could let the starters go a little deeper in the game. And offensively, I thought they were varied enough to win. So the question is, you know, Garrett Cole out there, a lot of people think he wants to pitch on the West Coast and the Dodgers do something like that. That is not been the way they operate under Andrew Friedman, right? They haven't been going out there and buying up huge free agents. They've extended some of their own, Jansen and Kershaw, but they haven't been a big player on the big name guys. But if Cole is out there, I think if you're the Dodgers or anybody, you have to see if he wants to play for your team and what the number is. Um, I think he's going to wind up with the Angels or somebody on the West Coast, That's at least what his teammates say. So I think they'd be involved in that. But I love the core of this team still, Rich. I mean, this kid, Gavin Lux, the youngster at second base, is going to be a player. Will Smith was a rookie behind the plate. Um, Disappointing, yeah, I think this one hurt more than the last few. But, um, again, I'm talking about a team that I think is going to be, again, odds-on favorite to win their division next year. And who's the Mets target now that Girardi went to Philadelphia um, and and they still are looking? Who's the guy? I I think it's Tim Bogar, and I actually think it's been Tim Bogar all along. Girardi was kind of the only one in the mix with really extensive managing experience for the Mets, partly because I think, you know, he knows the New York landscape, obviously. He won a championship there. I think that's important, or semi-important. It's not the number one priority when you're in New York. But I just think Brody with Van Wagen and his, like his best buddy in the world is A.J. Hitch, right? And I think that A.J. is kind of the template for what Brody would look for. And that, to me, means Tim Bogar. Uh, really smart dude. You know, he's done his time as a coach. You know, he's managed, if you want to count, interim uh, in Texas for about a month or so. Right. Um, has experience in New York, has connections to the team, played for the team. And I think the fact that he's been affiliated now with this Nationals team that's done so well the last few years uh, really helps him. So I would think it's going to wind up Bogar. All right, I lied. Last one. Who is Jace Tingler? I've n- I mean, who is – who? <laughs> it's, it honestly sounded like a Boogie Nights character to me, Tom. So who, who's Jace Tingler, the new Padres manager? Yeah, he's a guy A.J. Preller knows really well from his time in Texas. Um, Jace is a guy who has managed. He's coached. He's been uh, running player development. Uh, he's also gone to the Dominican and managed. He speaks Spanish well. Um, he just is really close with A.J. Preller. He ticks all the boxes that A.J. would look for in a manager. And I think Ron Washington does, too, and that's why it was interesting. He had a guy like Wash, a lot of experience. Jace, who you couldn't pick out if you bumped into him at the, the local supermarket. But I think it would be great to put Wash on that staff. I don't know if they can get him away from the Braves. Uh, as a bench coach, he'd be terrific. But uh, A.J. Preller knew both of, both those guys from Texas, and I think the fact that he's just so close with Jason, it's kind of like his model of what a manager should be. Without the experience, you never know a first-time guys, but listen, 10 postseason teams this year, Rich, eight of them had a manager on his first job. So mm. experience has been devalued yeah. in baseball when it comes to managing. Maybe this guy is the next Alex Cora. Could be. Um, but – yeah, I think we'll find out about uh, Jace pretty darn soon because they had some really good young talent. Tom, enjoy the experience and the atmosphere uh, in Washington, D.C. this weekend and the baby shark attack and all of that stuff. Uh, enjoy it. Yeah, thanks a lot, Rich. Appreciate it. You got it. Thanks for the call. That's Tom Verducci, one of the best in the business. For more of The Rich Eisen Show, tune to Audience Channel 239 on DirecTV for free on BR Live or download The Rich Eisen Show app.